Well, church, please turn with me this morning in God's Word to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. We are going to look at some familiar words this morning. If you've been in church much at all in your life, you should have heard these words many times. I think the familiarity of the Great Commission causes us to maybe not hear it because we've heard it before and we just kind of let those words flow over our ears and we don't stop and meditate and think about each word and each part and what is really being commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ in this incredibly important passage of Scripture. The Great Commission serves to tell us what is the mission of the church. What are we supposed to be doing? Now, if we ask that question of Christians across America, what is the church supposed to be doing? What should the church do? You're going to get a lot of answers. Some will say Bible study. Hearty amen to that. We ought to study God's Word. Some will say fellowship. Well, we love to be with the brothers and sisters in Christ and to spend time with one another and labor together. Praise and worship, some will say. We are to gather and proclaim the greatness and the glory in the name of our God. Maybe we are to feed the sick and help the poor. Those are certainly things the Bible says tells us to do. But none of those things in and of themselves are the mission of the church. Those are all things which contribute to the mission of the church and what we are supposed to be doing, but they're not the main thing. They're one of the things that we're supposed to do, but the main thing that we are supposed to do is found here in Matthew's Gospel at the very end of the book. The mission of the church is to make disciples. We are to make disciples. And we will do this through Bible study and through praise and worship and through fellowship and and through feeding the poor and caring uh, for those in need and the sick. We will will make disciples in, in many ways, but the main mission of the local church is to make disciples who will follow Jesus Christ. And this command is so important because I think we we get caught on the, the secondary matters. And we focus so much on church programs and, 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 and things that we want the, the church to be doing that we forget the main mission. We forget the real purpose. The Bible tells us we are to be making disciples of all nations, but some Christians aren't even making disciples of their own children in their own homes. Much less would they travel across the world to make a disciple if they won't do it in their living room. And also the Great Commission is not merely about overseas missions, though you better believe it commands us to do missions across the world. It's about missions in Africa and Asia, and it's about missions in Pollock. It's about missions here and there and everywhere in between. It's about evangelism everywhere. Taking the gospel across the street and across the oceans. Now, Jesus in the gospel of Matthew has been crucified for our sins, to die in our place, to pay the penalty for our sins. He was buried... And three days later, he rose from the grave. And since Jesus has risen from the grave at the beginning of Matthew chapter 28, he's been appearing to his disciples and the rest of the New Testament tells us he appeared to others at different times as well. And we read in verses 11 to 15 of Matthew 28 that a story was made up that the body of Jesus had been stolen because the religious teachers couldn't explain why the body of Jesus was not still in the tomb. So they lied and paid the Roman guards to say that the body had been stolen out of the tomb. 
They wanted to hide the fact that Jesus was risen from the grave. And this is all before Jesus would ascend into heaven. And so it's some time in the 50 days that Jesus was on the earth between his resurrection and his ascension in Acts chapter 1. Sometime in, in that period of, of time, we read here that Jesus had called his disciples for a special meeting. Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the eleven, that is the disciples minus Judas, who was dead at this point. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee and to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even into the ends of the earth, the end of the age. And so as we read this passage, I want you to hear Jesus speaking to his disciples saying, okay, I'm about to leave you here on the earth and ascend to heaven. Here's what you are supposed to be doing. If the main mission of the church were to study the Bible, then why would you be stuck here listening to my sermons when you could go to heaven and listen to Jesus preach? I know some of you like to listen to me preach. At least a few of you do. But nobody's as good of a preacher as Jesus. If the mission of the church were to study the Bible, the Bible study is going to be much better in heaven. If the mission of the church is praise and worship, do you think the praise and worship will be greater here this morning or when we're gathered with the saints from across all the ages with the angels before the throne of God in heaven? Just read Revelation 4 and 5. The, the praise and worship is far greater in heaven. What will the fellowship be like in heaven when you are gathered with your loved ones in Christ who have gone on before? When there will be no more death and you will be able to spend eternity with people that you've lost and you'll be able to meet Moses and Elijah and Abraham and Paul and Peter and John and Jesus himself. There will be no more poor in heaven. There will be no more sick in heaven. So if the mission of the church is to accomplish those things, well then why are we still here? Because we could do all of those things much better in heaven. The reason we're still here is because those things are not the primary mission of the church. The primary mission of the church is to make disciples. And you can't make disciples in heaven because everyone in heaven is already a disciple. The only time that we have to make disciples is while Jesus has us still here on this earth. And I want you to hear me this morning, brothers and sisters. Why are you on this earth? I'm not asking for the Sunday school answer. I'm asking you to answer from your own heart. Why are you here? What are you really living for? What are you investing your time and your talent in? If we were honest with ourselves, many of us are living to, to try to get a more comfortable life, to maybe accomplish certain career goals. We're, we're living for entertainment and, and pleasure and, and all of these things which in and of themselves are not bad, but they're not the main thing. They're not the reason Jesus has left us here. Listen, if you want to give God a reason to take you out of this world, just don't make disciples. 
Because it's the one thing that he has told you to do while you're here on this earth, make disciples. So if you're not going to do the one thing he's told you to do, then why should he keep you here? Jesus calls his 11 disciples to a mountain in Galilee. And it says in verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him. In the Bible, the only one you are to worship is God and God alone. So the fact that they worship Jesus shows that they understand Jesus to be God in human flesh. And yet, we are told some doubted. Now, some Bible commentators have said here, well, this might have been the meeting that Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, where he talks about that in his resurrection appearances, there was one time when Jesus appeared to more than 500 people. I don't know if this is the appearance to over 500 people or not, But it seems to me that Matthew is speaking of some of the 11 disciples themselves doubting in this moment. That's the incredible thing. Whether others were present or not, the only ones that Matthew tells us about who were here when the Great Commission was given in verse 16 were the 11 disciples. And then in verse 17 he says, they, the 11 disciples, saw Jesus, and they, the 11 disciples, worshipped him. Were others with them? Maybe. Maybe so. But Matthew does seem focused here on the 11 disciples. And he says of them that some doubted. How can you doubt at this point? We know that it had to be after they went into the upper room and locked themselves there. And Jesus came and appeared twice. And he he comes to Thomas and he says, put your finger in my side. Touch the holes in my hands and feet and see that it is I. These men did not lack evidence that Jesus was risen from the grave. This was not the first time that they had seen him risen. And yet still some are doubting. This just shows the the incredible fallenness of the human mind and heart that with all the evidence... They still have times of doubt and fear. But isn't that true of you and I as well? How many gospel sermons have you heard in your life? How many times have you heard God's word, read God's word, shared God's word, had someone share with you God's word? And something happens in your life and you doubt. You see, we're not all that different from the disciples. It wasn't for a lack of evidence that they doubted. It was because of the fallenness of their own hearts. They were weak and frail, timid, fearful. Even here, seeing the risen, glorified Jesus, some doubted. Nonetheless, Jesus commands them what they are to do after he leaves this earth, between the time of his ascension and his future return. And we are living in that time between his first and second comings. Verse 18, And Jesus came, which is to say he must have been at a distance, so he walked closer. Maybe they doubted because they didn't know if it was really Jesus in the distance. I don't know, but Jesus came closer to them. And he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Notice this is an authority in verse 18 that has been given to Jesus. Well, if the authority has been given, who gave the authority to Jesus? The answer is the Father gave his Son authority over all the heavens and the earth, over all of creation. So before giving the command to go and make disciples, before telling us what to do, Jesus reminds us of who it is who is commanding us. You see, if someone tells you what to do, it makes a huge difference who it is that is commanding you, doesn't it? I mean, if one of my children tries to order me around, 
I'm probably not going to listen that much and say, look, son, daughter, I love you, but you don't really know what you're talking about. and You don't have the authority to boss me around. But if on the way home a police officer pulls me over and gives me a command, if I'm smart, I better listen. And if Jesus shows up, the one to whom all authority in, in heaven and on earth is given, we better listen. It matters who it is who is commanding us, and he is the king and ruler of the heavens and the earth. And notice here that Jesus says all authority has been given to him in heaven and on the earth. He doesn't say most. He says all authority belongs to him. I just want to say, this is why it is so blasphemous for people today to attribute to Satan the things that only God can do. Satan does not know all things. Satan cannot be all places at all times. Satan is not responsible for everything that is going on. Satan does not have any authority of his own. Look at what Jesus says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says. And what that means is that Satan does nothing apart from the explicit permission of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people have this idea that Jesus and Satan are fighting back and forth with one another in this great tug of war between good and evil. And someone dies and someone says, oh, Satan took him from us. No. Jesus determines when people live, when they're born and when they die and how long they live. Satan didn't take them. Jesus appointed the time of their birth and the time of their death from eternity past. No, there's not a great tug of war between good and evil being fought out in this war between Jesus and Satan. No, it's not a tug of war. No, Jesus is dragging Satan around like a rag doll, making him go wherever he wants him to go. And when Satan does something, it is because Jesus is using Satan to accomplish his own purposes. Satan has no authority of his own. Jesus has all authority. And Jesus is in absolute sovereign control of all things. All authority. In heaven and on the earth. Which is to say whether in the heavenly realms over the angels and the demons or on the earth. In this next election, ultimately, Jesus will choose who gets elected. And you say, well, I thought we voted and chose. We do. And the Bible says that the king's heart is like water in the hands of God. He turns it whichever way he wills. People will vote in this election and God is in control of the hearts of the people who will vote and the people who get elected will either be the mercy of God upon this nation or the judgment of God upon this nation. But I can tell you this much, whomever is elected and whatever happens in the future will be at the command of Almighty God. I didn't say it's going to be good or bad. I said it's going to be according to God's purposes. And it is absolutely under His control and authority. And for that reason alone, we should not be afraid. So Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth given to Him by His Father. And now in verse 19 comes the command. And the command is one verb, make disciples. There are three participles that modify the command to make disciples. In, in Greek, a participle tells you how or when or, or in what way to do something. And so the three participles here are going, baptizing, and teaching. And those things all tell you how and when and in what way to make disciples. The first thing we see here is go, therefore, and make disciples. The word here, go, could be best translated as you go, or, or going, make disciples. 
You need to intentionally set about wherever you are in this world to go into this world and make disciples. It might be going into the workplace. It might be going into the schools. It might be going across the world to a foreign nation to share the gospel. But the point is, as you go throughout this life, you need to be going with a mission and a purpose that you're going to make disciples. You cannot just sit back and wait for someone else to do it. You must go and make disciples. And I just want to ask you this question this morning. To each one here, how many disciples have you made lately? How many disciples? Think. Think of their names. Think of their faces. Are there any? Maybe one or two? How many disciples have you made? You know, this is the one thing that Jesus has commanded you and I to do. Are we even doing it? The sad answer for many is, I haven't really made any disciples lately. I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I'm just here to tell you we need to get to work. We need to start doing the very thing that Jesus has commanded us to do. I mean, this is the primary mission of the church. And we are the church. You are part of the church. Are you doing the number one job that Jesus has given you to do? If you are a parent, the first place you need to make disciples is in your home. If you are married, the first place before that, I should say, you should make disciples is with your husband or your wife. We, we, this needs to start in the home and it needs to extend to the Sunday school and, and, and all the things in the church, but then it's got to go outside these walls and it's got to go into the schools and the workplaces and the grocery stores. It, it, it's around your Thanksgiving table as you're sitting across from your family members. It's as you talk to your friends on the phone. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you need to be about the business of making disciples. And God has put you in places that I cannot go. I don't get to go to your workplace every week and sit across from the people whom you sit across from. I don't have the chance to tell them about Jesus like you do. And He's put you in that place so that you can make disciples of the people around you. So are you doing it? You see, it's not just the job of the pastors to make disciples. It's the job of the church. Every one of us is tasked with this. Every one of us must be doing this. So I'm asking you the question, how many disciples have you made lately? And if the answer is not many or none at all, then you need to decide in your heart today, you need to confess to God right here this morning, God, I've not been doing what you've commanded me to do and I intend to start doing it today. I'm not here to beat up on you. I'm just here to say let's get about doing God's work. Let's start fulfilling the mission, the whole reason that God has left us here on this earth. Go and make disciples. It is a command in the Greek. It's not a suggestion. God's not dropping a hint. God is saying, Jesus is saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me and I am commanding you as the king of heaven and earth that you must make disciples. And if you don't make disciples, you are disobeying the king of heaven and earth. And there will be consequences if we do not obey our king. He says, make disciples. And then he tells us who to make disciples of. He says, of all nations. The Greek phrase here is pantata ethne. Of all the nations and and, and, and Ethnos in in Greek is is a word that doesn't merely mean geopolitical nations. The United States of America, Germany, Russia, China, Japan. We're, We're not just talking about political boundaries. But this word ethne, it's it's used in the New Testament to speak of all the families, all the tribes, all the peoples who live upon the face of the earth. For instance, This phrase is used in Acts chapter 17 verse 26 by the Apostle Paul where the Word of God says, And God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of all the earth. The word there, every nation, is every ethne, every people group. 
Or as the Bible puts it in Revelation 5 verse 9, He redeemed by His blood people from every tribe, language, nation, ethne, and tongue. This word doesn't just mean go to other nations, but go to all peoples of all kinds across the whole planet. No matter what their background is, no matter what their lineage is, no matter what their skin color is, go to all people and tell them about Jesus because He loves them and He's going to offer them salvation through you and I. Make disciples of all nations. It starts here and it goes everywhere around the world. And notice what we are to make. We are to make disciples. This word, matheteo in Greek, disciples, literally, it, it's the word learners. And it, it means more than someone who is a student, like in a classroom. It, it includes that. But it's someone who learns the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they can live those truths and follow Jesus Christ. A disciple of Jesus is someone who is constantly learning. It's interesting that when Jesus wants to describe those who follow Him, He calls us learners. That is to assume from the start that we don't know the things we need to know, and, but He's going to teach us those things that we need to know. We don't know it all. He does know it all, so He's going to teach us all the things that we need to know. Amen, somebody. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is we don't have this figured out, do we? And we need to learn from Jesus how to live for Jesus. So Jesus says, make disciples. He didn't just say make spokesmen. He said make disciples. The first thing you're going to have to do in becoming a Christian is you're going to have to realize that this world has lied to you. You're going to realize that you don't understand it all. But Jesus, from His Word, from the Scriptures, will teach you all you need to know. You're going to have to be a disciple you're going to have to learn and then live what you've learned by following Jesus. Now when you make these disciples from all the nations, He says you are to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The word baptizo is a word literally means to submerge in water. That's what the Greek word means. To submerge in water. It could just say submerging or immersing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When the born again believer in Jesus Christ is immersed under the water, Romans 6 tells us that that is a powerful testimony to what God has done in their life. They are buried with Jesus in baptism. The, the person they used to be is dead and gone. They are not the person they were before. That person is buried and gone and then they come out of the water, raised to walk in the newness of life. Now they're going to walk and lead and live a life for Jesus. So, so, so the old person is gone, and the new person has come out of the waters of baptism, ready to follow Jesus. So when you make disciples, you are to immerse them in water, literally is what it means. Baptize them. And when you do this, baptize them in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, it doesn't say in the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It says in the name. Why is it in the name singular? Because God is one. We don't worship three gods. We worship one God. So people are to be baptized in the name. And then he gives us three names to be baptized in. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now wait a minute. I thought we were to be baptized in the one name. You are. Well then why is he telling us to be baptized in three names? Because there is one God, eternally existent as three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our oneness Pentecostal friends will tell us that the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is Jesus because they do not believe of three persons within the Godhead. Problem with that is, is that three names are given here, number one. Problem with that is, is that Jesus is here telling us how to baptize people and what to say when we baptize them. 
In the book of Acts, when we're told that people are baptized in the name of Jesus, it means they are baptized as followers of Jesus. But we are not given word for word in the book of Acts what is to be said when a person is baptized. But we are right here in Matthew 28, 19. And Jesus says, when you baptize people, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, the claim that the name here is the name of Jesus does not match the rest of the New Testament. Where in the New Testament is the Father called Jesus? Where are we told that the Holy Spirit's name is Jesus? We're not. There's not a single place in the New Testament where Jesus is identified as anyone other than God the Son. Jesus may be the name of the Son, but that's not the name of the Father and the Spirit. If there is only one person in the Godhead, if Jesus, the, the, if, if the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all the same person, then when Jesus was praying in the garden, who was he praying to? Was he praying to himself? Was Jesus literally talking to himself when he prayed? Does that make sense? When he says, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. How does one person have two wills? How is that even possible? Jesus either wants to go to the cross or he doesn't. He says, Father, I'd really rather not suffer, but Lord, if it's your, Father, if it's your will that I would die for their sins, I'll do it. Why does he distinguish between his will and the Father's will? I'll tell you why. Because there's two persons. Why does Jesus say in John 10, 20, the Father and I, we are one? He didn't say the Father and I, I am one. He said, the Father and I, we, are one. We means more than one person. There are three persons within the Godhead. There's one God, but there are three names given here. The name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit, who are all one God. The word Trinity means three in one. And that's exactly what we see here in Matthew 20. Verse 19. We are to baptize them in the name of the triune God of heaven and earth. And then after we baptize them in the name of the Trinitarian God, verse 20, we are teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Boy, do we fall short of this. What has Jesus commanded us? Where are we going to find what he's commanded us? We'll find it right here in this book. How many Christians have really read their whole Bible? I'm not looking for a show of hands, but have you read your whole Bible? And if you haven't read your whole Bible, can you really teach the whole Bible if you don't even know what it says? And it doesn't just say that preachers are supposed to do this. It's it's all disciples. We are all expected to read our Bibles and to be able to share the gospel from our Bibles with other people and make disciples in that way. He says, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. Every word of it. Don't neglect one part. Even Leviticus, Obadiah. I mean, read every part. Read Philemon. Read all those chapters in Revelation that you just skip over because they don't make any sense to you. We'll study them together. Pastors will help teach them to you so that you can understand them better. But you are to learn what the whole counsel of God says and then you are to teach all that Jesus has commanded to other people. He says, teach them to observe. This word is best translated obey. Your translation may say, teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. And that's the best translation of the word. Teach them to obey what God has commanded them in the scriptures. This is what we are doing in the local church. We teach the word of God so that we may obey the word of God. It's not enough just to know what it says. You have to actually obey it. Head knowledge alone is of no value. You must have heart knowledge. There were many Pharisees who could recite all of the first five books of the Bible. Some even claimed to be able to recite the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. Maybe they could. But Jesus said to them, Have you not read 
the Scriptures. They may have had it memorized, but some of them didn't even understand what it said. It's not enough just to know. You've got to obey. We've got to teach people what the Word says and teach them to obey what the Word says. And lastly, you may be thinking, well, I don't know if I can do all this. I'm not good at sharing my faith and I don't know enough about the Bible and I don't know if I can really do it. And that's why Jesus ends with these words, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is saying here, look, you're not doing this in your own strength, in your own power. I'm not leaving you alone to do this. Jesus, the omnipresent God of heaven and earth, though He has ascended to the right hand of the Father, He is still really present with us right now. This is why Jesus can say in Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. Jesus is with us. Yes, He's at the right hand of the Father in heaven, but He's also right here with us, and He's there with you when you share your faith with your neighbor. He's not left you alone. He says, I am with you always, at all times. He's never left you alone. And if you think He has, you're wrong. He's never left you alone. I am with you always. Well, how long are you going to be with me? To the end of the age. In other words, until I come back. And until I come back, this is what you are to do. Make disciples. So church, every one of us, we must learn to do. And we must start doing the main thing that Jesus has commanded every one of us to do we must make disciples. Let's pray. Father, as we've read your word this morning, I, I pray that every one of us would see how we all fall short of this command. And I just begin by praying, Lord, forgive us. But Lord, what we are not make us. Lord, what we know not teach us. Lord, what we have not give us. God, we haven't done these things, so help us to do them starting now, today. Help us to make disciples. God, fill up the baptistry right here in this church at Pollock with new disciples of Jesus. Increase the numbers of those worshiping with us with new disciples. Lord, we plead and we pray for disciples from all the nations. God, help us to be faithful. Call us to the specific ways in which you want each one of us to serve and reveal it to our hearts. And Lord, do not let us ignore or disobey May it all be for the glory of your Son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.